Well, good morning. Good morning. Hey, good morning, and good morning if you're watching this online. Um, we're back for the equipping classes in November. We are going to be looking at in November the idea of Advent and Christmas. And uh, before I do, I just want to mention that I consider it as part of what we've, we've been doing, our historical uh, Christianity contemporary faith series. And what I mean by that? Well, I mean by the, the, the equipping classes that we've had over the months where we looked at church history or we looked at the Bible or we looked at the creeds and the confessions and sacraments. I consider this also an element of, uh, of that sort of uh, instruction and learning and, and application. Uh, you know, last month we looked at Romans and sort of that's a Bible theology class. And we're going to have another one in January on temple and tabernacles. But I want us to think about this in the way of historical Christianity and how it works into our contemporary faith. Does that sound, sound good, doable? We're all in the right place? Make sense? Okay, so the way we're going to look at this is the objective. So what's a deliverable? Whether you join us for one week or three weeks, I want us to gain a deeper understanding of and an appreciation for the biblical and the historical Christmas story, the Christmas narrative of scripture that was not in a vacuum, but was actually in history, living history, to survey the origin and the meaning of this uniquely Christian practice of Advent that happens within the Christmas season as well. So the Christmas narrative, biblical historical understanding, and then Advent as this practice that is uniquely Christian, and it occurs this time of year. And so the importance of that to me is that, um, you know, inter intertwined with the Christmas narrative this time of year are, um, just in case we have young ears out there, uh, a, a particular fantasy story as well. <laughs> a fantasy character that we wish to and, and that sort of thing. And if we're not careful, we start to intertwine uh, the reality of the season, the reason for the season. That We start to entwine the actual narrative of the Christmas story as being this sort of fantasy story as well. And so I am hopeful that uh, today, in particular, the reason that we start with the idea of the first Christmas is that we can sort of separate this. We can see them as distinct. I'm not saying that we have to run from these other things that we celebrate or have fun with, but I want us to separate them uh, from some of the other things that get really intertwined. So today we're going to be looking at the first Christmas. Next week, we're going to look at the actual practice of Advent, the what, the why, and the how. And then finally, in week three, uh, we're going to be looking at those Christmas practices. Uh, where, did, where did they really start to develop the nativity? Uh, where, where did we start to uh, the carols and, and sort of the way we celebrate it today? When did that enter the church? And uh, how did we get here? And then what are some other practices today? I have thoughts around the Moravian practices and all kinds of stuff. So that's sort of week three. Um, does that make sense in a good flow? Uh, and so I really appreciate both online and here. Uh, this is the first time I've really taught this subject matter. I've been spending uh, the better part of the past couple months in the Gospel of Luke in preparation for an upcoming ser sermon series. And um, wow, I just, I, there's, the first two chapters are so rich uh, that I've done just a good bit of research on the Christmas narrative of Luke and Matthew. And so I'm excited, but if you feel like there's a better way that it can flow after we're done, I'd love to hear that. Okay, but that's where we're going. That's the deliverable, and that's what we're going to expect. So the first Christmas, the Christmas narrative, let's get our bearings. Okay, this first part, let's just talk about getting our bearings. And the way I want to do this is I want to do this with a little bit of class participation. Okay, I want to start with one of us. Okay, and then I'm just going to go around the room, and I'd like us to tell the Christmas story. Okay. The thing is, you get one sentence. You may have the, the you day. may have the best line of the whole day, Derek. Day. Two words. The end. Fantastic. <laughs> All right, the end. I, I, I think from the Christmas story itself. Okay, if we got to that point where Herod, okay, maybe we could have backed it up even further. All right. So as we go through it, really, what I want us to do is is think about. All right, what did we? Um, how did we do? What did we leave out? All right. And what did we add in that's really not part of the Christmas story? What's not really in there? Okay. Does anybody just out of the, just sort of thinking on top of your head, did we leave anything out? All right. 
So here's how we're now going to look at this. Keep this in the back of our mind, all right, as we move through, and then let's see where we are at the end if we were to tell it again. Okay, we're going to use for our basis, uh, we're, and it's on the handout that you have today, and this is online as well at Church Center. You can, uh, you can download this and all the slides. Uh, what I've done is I've gone through Matthew and Luke. Matthew, one of the 12 disciples, he was an eyewitness, right? He heard all the stories. He was there for the teachings of Jesus. Luke uh, was a, uh, considered a historian. He did all the research, as we're going to see in Luke, that he talked to many eyewitnesses. Many, many think, because of what he writes in Luke 2, that he spoke to the mother of Jesus, Mary. So these are two of the very best firsthand accounts we could possibly ever have about the birth of Jesus on top of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit leading him on what to write and tell and share. And what I've done is um, I have ordered the Christmas story chronological between these two books. So this handout, which begins with Luke 126, you see goes to Matthew 118 and then back to Luke 139, uh, goes all the way through. And, and then on the back, you will see the major, what I would call scenes or settings of the Christmas story that correlate to those paragraphs of scriptures throughout. That's what we're going to walk through this morning, okay? That's what we're going to try to get an overview to, to really get our bearings and understand what's going on. And um, through that, um, I, I just I, I think there's some great insight and uh, we just really um, have just wonderful words of scripture. But we also have wonderful words of history that speak into this as well. So let's go through this. Let's break this down and let's just look at each segment just for a moment. All right. So the first scene or setting of the Christmas story, I believe you, while you could start with John the Baptist, the angels come into uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, I would suggest for our purposes, we're going to start the Christmas story as saying the angel Gabriel came to Mary. That's in Luke 126 through 38. So let's talk about Mary. What do we know about Mary? All right, here's a few things that I would suggest that, are, that we know or that are most likely uh, possible, probable, okay? One is she would have never recognized the name Mary. <laughs> well, even today we use this name as an English name, but her name was never uh, the equivalent of Mary. It was Miriam, okay? So she would have understood that her name was Miriam. In the, in the Hebrew, it's Miriam. In the Greek, it's Mariam. And somewhere along the line, like many aspects of the Christmas narrative that we're going to discover, somewhere along the line to the English translation of the Middle Ages and the understanding of the language at that point, which was still a little bit rudimentary, we just sort of transition completely to Mary. But truly, it was Joseph, Yosef, and Miriam. Okay, so that's one thing. We know just a little thing, right? We're just kind of a little thing. She was from Nazareth. So that meant she spoke Aramaic. But being from Nazareth and speaking Aramaic, and we're going to see later where that, where that actually is geographically, uh, she would have known uh, Latin because there was such a strong Roman uh, stronghold there. It was also, that was the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, language of commerce that came through there. She would have known uh, Greek as, as well. Uh, the sort of Greek would have been the, you know, the overriding language of the entire region. Uh, she would have known Hebrew because this was a very traditional and Jewish uh, settlement. And she would have known, known that through her teachings at the synagogue, the local synagogue. So she would have been, at, even at an early age, she would have been really fluent in all these languages. She was the younger cousin to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is John the Baptist's um, mother. Right. And we know that she was the younger cousin. How, how do we know that? Because the Bible tells us so. Yeah. <laughs> what does the angel tell Elizabeth when she's going to have a baby? Better. Well, and also that even in your old age, you know, she's been barren and in her old age, she is going to have a, a, a baby. And so we know that that Mary's the younger cousin to Elizabeth. And that's important here in a moment. Um, we also know that in Palestine, the Bible never tells us this, but the typical betrothal to be betrothed to someone was typically around the age of 13 or 14. Could Mary have been older? Absolutely. Was it likely that she was 13, 14, somewhere in there to be betrothed? Yes, that was likely the custom. So that's, that's probably uh, what's going on here. And we know that she was likely fluent in the Torah. So the first five books of the Bible, she would have known with, with all her heart. It would have been oral tradition, and she could have really just taught us 
about the first five books of the Bible. And then likely many, many more things about the prophets and the Psalms, as we'll see here in a moment as well. Um, Mary, does, uh, is this how, how we've characterized how we think of Mary? Pretty much. Any other questions? So why, why would it be important to know that she was that fluent in the Torah and that this was really something a very Jewish um, culture, uh, religiously as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though when the angel comes to her, she's certainly, you know, startled and uh, she's treasuring things up in her heart later and all that, uh, she would have still had this idea that, oh, wow, you know, does she know? I don't know, but she certainly knew, knew uh, the Hebrew scriptures. Very, very likely. So, so we have Mary, and that's, that's really the opening of the, um, of the Christmas story. Gabriel comes uh, and, and speaks to her. And, uh, and then what happens in Matthew next? What happens after he goes to, well, huh, he goes to Joseph, right? We see the angel Gabriel come to Joseph next, starting in Matthew 1, 18. And we'll look back at this. Um, why did he have to go to Joseph? Why did Gabriel have to go to Joseph? Give a little counsel. Little counsel. He was going to do, quietly, but still. Yeah, like, yeah, like uh, Desi Arnaz used to say, Lucy, you got some explaining to do, right? So um, that's, that's Gabriel's reassurance there too. And we'll see his message here, here in a little bit. But um, Gabriel goes to Joseph. What do we know about Joseph? Yeah, that's really important. He, he was a just and upright man. He was righteous. We know that uh, also sort of post-Christmas what he does. I mean, where we see him, right? He's going to the temple for the dedication. He's uh, even the story when Jesus is a child, right? Where they, they're going to the synagogue, they're going to the temple. He's, he's raising his children as a just and upright man. He, he was going to do this faithfully to separate with her, uh, you know, quietly. And, and, and you could sort of get the heart of Joseph. Uh, through what we read in scripture. You know, some other thoughts about him. He also was from Nazareth, spoke Aramaic. So again, an Aramaic speaking family. He was a descendant of King David, which is important in both of how this narrative progresses later, but also through the prophecies of whom Jesus would come, right? He was a carpenter. Now, you can read and read and read and read and read all sorts of uh, online research on this. At the end of the day, the word for carpenter is used just as often for stonemason and metallurgist as it is for woodworker. And so, again, this was part of this in the, in the sort of Middle Age tradition of English translation of Scripture. We, we all sort of went directly to, well, this is what it means in, in uh, Western Europe to be a carpenter. So that must be what Jesus' father was. A craftsman's is actually a better translation. And I would suggest that a lot of paraphrases today use craftsman instead of carpenter. So I, the idea, though, again, is that this, he was very hardworking, providing for his family. Just man. You know, we start to get a picture. Now, most people, the reason they think that he was older than Mary was both the, the cultural aspect of Palestine, but also that it does seem likely that he died just about the time that Jesus' earthly ministry was taking off. Uh, we don't see any sort of scriptural evidence of Mary and Joseph together after that time. Uh, we don't really, we never get a word spoken from Joseph in scripture. Um, now, older though, could in that day and time, could be early 20s, could have been late 20s. Uh, by the time Jesus' ministry took off another 30 years, he would have been near 50, which was an old, older guy back then and, and past for a lot of different reasons. So... I would suggest somewhere between 20 and 40 was probably the age of Joseph. But uh, either way, uh, you start to get a picture of who he was and, and well-respected and hardworking, just and faithful. He's also said he's God-fearing, God-fearing man. So Joseph and Mary, the first two parts of our, our Christmas narrative start off with the angel coming to them. And um, uh, there's something the angel says that I think we, we look at here in a second. Now, Nazareth. Um, 
This is where they're from. So let's talk a little bit about Nazareth because this plays into our understanding of what historically would have happened. Um, Nazareth, uh, this, that's a sort of an early 19th century photo or late 19th century, early 20th century photo on, on the left here. Kind of a sleepy village along the hillside, right? A lot of the, just sort of stone houses. It would have looked similar to this. It would have been location-wise right here. And then the one... Um, marker or landmark that is believed to have existed at the time of the first century is the water well uh, that has been obviously rebuilt the structure but uh, over here on this side where they've gone uh, this little inlet people they still carry water from there today and they believe that that was the source of the local water in the first century which is no more than just sort of a fascination a curiosity of hey you know mary miriam was likely one to go to that water area there to take water to the family. So Nazareth, more importantly, about 500 people, between four and 600 people at the time of Jesus's birth. Um, so they were a farming village, 15 miles west of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus would eventually return and the bulk of his early ministry would be around Galilee. Very conservative from some of the archeological digs and, and explorations there. Uh, they can tell that it was a very traditionally Jewish uh, village in their practices of a local synagogue that's been unearthed and some of the homes of the burial sites would both indicate the population but also indicate uh, the sort of traditions that went along with their burials in Nazareth. They were highly learned in the Torah because of that as well. So Joseph and Mary both. Um, and, and their status as just sort of the little bitty small dot on the map is indicated in Scripture in a couple of ways. One, uh, you know, we see in John uh, where it's spoken of, Nazareth, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then also in the list of um, places that are named uh, as far as the tribes and, and areas of that area, Nazareth was always sort of left off of that because they were just, it was just a small sort of out of the way place. Okay, now um, we continue. So the angel goes to uh, Mary, the angel goes to Joseph. And then we're told that Mary in Luke 1 39, she arose and with haste, she went to the hill country to be in town of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and Elizabeth and Elizabeth is her cousin, her older cousin. And we have this exchange between Elizabeth recognizing that Mary has been divinely ordained by God to carry God's son. And she knows this from her own, uh, you know, her own pregnancy that she feels John kicking. And she says this, uh, behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And this is an important part of the Christmas story, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, when we look back at um, what the angel said to Mary... In, um, look at Luke 1, 36. Right? She's telling Mary everything that's going on in Mary's life. And then, or, and then, or the angel's telling, Gabriel's telling. And then out of the blue, he says, oh, and behold, also, you should know, your, your relative, your older cousin Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month of her who was once barren, called barren. And look what is added. For nothing is impossible with God. That is so instrumental to the Christmas story. Gabriel, the Lord knew Mary needed to hear this, right? You, you are going to have a child. You have not had relations. And the Lord is going to be with you. You're going to be called blessed. And I mean, the doubts, the, the, the uncertainties... I know the Lord led John the Baptist on the scene to, be, to prepare the way as well, and there was purpose for that. But I'm convinced is that part of the pregnancy of Elizabeth at this moment with John the Baptist was to demonstrate to Mary and to Joseph that nothing was impossible with God. To further her trust in what she was about to go through. Elizabeth, at her age, she's pregnant? No way. Well, if that, well, if that can happen, I, sure. And, you know, and Mary even leaves that, right? Well, behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And it was after that assurance, I believe, where she says about Elizabeth. But uh, you ever been from Missouri, right? Missouri's the show me state, right? Trust, but verify. The angel comes, da, 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 this is, and Mary too. And then Mary in this part, uh, I'm going to get over to Elizabeth really quick. I got to see this. 
Uh, she needs to know about me, but I want to see what's going on with her. She's really pregnant at her age. She's never delivered. And so she goes to Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth, a couple of things we've already talked about, mother of John the baptizer, um, wife of Zechariah in Luke 1, 5 through 25. And we know about Zechariah. He was a priest at the temple. And he was part of the tribe, part of the group that every 26 weeks, he served one week at the temple in Jerusalem. He would have to go down to Jerusalem, serve his week. But uh, this, was, this was also Zechariah and Elizabeth who were upright and righteous and just and uh, was actually part of the priesthood. Um, Elizabeth's mother was of the line of Aaron. So there was the line of Aaron. And then Elizabeth's father, like Mary, would have been from the line of David. And this is all in Scripture before we get here. But she was the older cousin to Mary. She was righteous before God. God's, God uses, uses us in our fallen, sinful ways, but he uses us when we are pursuing righteousness, I believe. Right? So it's one thing for him to say, yeah, he, he really use, he uses some of us that really we, we kind of look and see, but he knows our hearts. He knows that our desire is to be upright and just, and I think that's where God really uses people. And he, she was told no, you know, nothing was impossible, uh, even though she had no children and she was old in age. So she goes, they have this cousin time, this wonderful verification of what's going on. And then in verse 46 through 55, Mary has, does anybody know what this is called in fancy church words? Magnificat. Yeah, the Magnificat. Um, the Magnificat is this song of praise that Mary, uh, when Elizabeth confirms in her that she has really been divinely touched by God to carry God. What we see in this, what are some of the lines in that Magnificat that really stand out? I mean, really the whole thing is just beautiful, right? It's a, it's a testimony to both Mary's, um, her obedience in her heart, but it's a testimony to her knowledge of Scripture and her knowledge of who God is. Now, if we looked further, if we did a whole week on the Magnificat, what we would discover, discover is that it's um, the Song of Mary. If you ever hear it called the Song of Mary as well. Magnificat is really the Latin for magnify, which in Latin magnifies the very first word of this song. So it just became known in church history as the Magnificat. Um, it is filled with Old Testament allusions and quotes. And not only is Mary pulling from the Old Testament, she's pulling from the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. She knows the Hebrew Scriptures, and she's just, just really just reciting them, singing them, really, praising back to God His own words. They, they echo, if you guys remember Hannah's prayer, it's beautiful, beautiful poem. As you read the Christmas narrative, perhaps in your home, to yourself, in a group, with your family, um, don't miss the Magnificat. Maybe make that one night's reading. The Magnificat is just a beautiful song of praise. Okay? All right, so the angels have come. Mary has gone to her cousin Elizabeth. And now we're told in Scripture that after Mary remained there three months, why would she ever remain there three months? But also Elizabeth, when Mary first was told, was six months pregnant. She, yeah, it's, it seems that she stayed and helped Elizabeth have the baby. Right? It's pretty about is going from Nazareth to Bethlehem, really. And then I'll talk about the census. I think this is important just to, again, getting our bearings. Nazareth, we said about 15 miles um, west of the Sea of Galilee. Um, they, they would have traveled along the Jordan Valley. And you see Bethlehem is just about five miles south of Jerusalem. But here's what generates this whole thing. The census, right? The census. Um, the census takes place from Caesar Augustus, our history. All right? But we can be pretty sure that the census was between 6 and 2 B.C., Based on all of these, if we, if we just sort of most liberal with all of the windows they give us, we just sort of go there, okay? Now hang with me because we keep going. This was not the first Roman census. There had been Roman censuses taken for many, well, since really 60 BC when they came on the scene. They took over, sort of uh, kicked the Greeks out. Um, this was the very first one to include the Jews. And we see this where he says, now there's a decree that all the world should be registered. 
prior to that, the censuses were only Roman citizens. Well, they start to expand. They've got huge, I mean, it, really, they were a gift relative to the Western world and the Eastern world with transportation and road systems and aqueducts and all those sort of things. And so they start expanding and, well, now we need some money, <laughs> right? But they say Rome wasn't built in a day. And so they, they had to start collecting money and they said, you know what? Not only Roman citizens, we need to know who all is living under our, our empire and uh, we need to start taxing. And so this was really one of the first uh, census taken that would have sort of brought in extra revenue um, for, the, for the emperor. All right, so the empire building and the taxes, and this is really what's going on. Um, the tribal lineage to that, this was very common even in the Roman census to say, all right, you go and register at the place of your, you know, your, your family genealogy. Um, how would you have taken it, though, if this was the very first time you were asked to be counted as a Jew? You just do it, right? Now, you know, maybe you, you, you have plans and, and you're thinking, oh, my goodness, he's, we've got six months to do it, but would have taken it very seriously. This would have been something very seriously, and there never would have been an option. Well, Joseph, why don't you go on down and I'll stay here? You know, no, 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 no. Rome called. Let's, we better do this, right? So, yeah, it, you know, it's interesting. I was over, well, over sabbatical. One of the things that I really enjoy doing, I've never done, is a genealogy sort of study. And, and just, I was fascinated by all of the old census paperwork that's on file out there for your family, if you look for it. You know, great, great, great grandparents and where they had to, they would go somewhere and then someone would write their name in and where they're from and who, but they had to go to that one place and always make that trip there. Yeah. Really good. So they, they go to Bethlehem. So we've got the, the, the trip. We know that we're headed there. And what was the name of Mary's donkey? <laughs> she probably didn't have a donkey. We just like to put her on one because we, we think we, we don't want her walking. Uh, we also don't know how far in advance this was from her delivery. Right? She was just told pregnant. We know that it had to be at least three months along because she went to see Elizabeth and stayed there three months, came back. She might have been four months pregnant. She might have been eight months pregnant. But we know they made the trip, right? This, this trip was about, um, it was about, uh, that I should have said on the map, it was about 80 miles, 80 to 90 miles, depending on how you go. It was about a four-day trip back in the days along the Jordan Valley, about a four-day trip. And um, so we're, we're, we're on our way, and then we're told, you know, that uh, those days of Caesars, Joseph went up to Galilee, and then while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And then Matthew at that point says, but, you know, Jesus, Joseph did not know her um, intimately, relationally, after he got the news from the, from the angel until after she had given birth to a son. So those those two verses are really all, all we have about the birth of Jesus. That um, we, we sometimes, again, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest there's nothing wrong with what your nativity is at home. But as we look at this, I'm going to suggest that probably what the reality of it was. And, and then again, look at these two verses. So the birth of Jesus, what do we know? We know that the word for in, right? The word for in is a Greek word called kataluma. Kataluma is the word that was used right here where it says there was no room for them in the inn. There is one other place in Scripture where that word is used. Does anybody know? Keep that in mind, but no. No, because the Good Samaritan, they put him in an inn, right? Kind of a traveler's inn. The only other place in Scripture that Kataluma is used to describe a space or a place is the upper room of Jesus in the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. The Passover. That's the only other place that's used in two Gospels, Cataluma. And again, this is one of those that based on what I believe is pretty extensive research, based on trusted sources for me, I would suggest a likely probable. Doesn't, at the end of the day, it's, it doesn't matter, barn, cave, stable, whatever. But the Cataluma was generally a place as an upper room or a guest room in a house. Right. And so what we know about Bethlehem at this time is this census was happening. The, the, and if you imagine, I mean, this is the city of David. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands are moving into this small village. So where you did have family, 
right? As you get there, as you send word, hey, can we stay with you? We're coming for the census. Can we stay with you? Can we? The likely scenario is that the family members for whom Joseph and Mary are coming to are saying, oh my goodness, you want Uncle Albert and Myrtle, they're already upstairs in the inn. They're already in the guest room. That's all we, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have a space in the inn for you, right? As, as the guest in place, the guest room place. And so, uh, but we do have a place that most of our homes are built like. And, and that's in the, the, the main floor, you know, the, the extension where the animals are brought in as well. We do have space for you if you'll sleep down there. When I say the, the, the main floor, this is a very sort of uh, typical of, of some of the houses for which they would have had livestock or farms is they have sort of a courtyard storage area that would have been enclosed. They would have pinned in some animals, particularly on cold nights, late nights, birthing times of year. Um, and then they would have slept upstairs in their rooms, including the Cataluma, which would have been more for the guests. Okay? This was really hard for me to uh, conceive at first until uh, in Myanmar five years ago, we go to a national park where they have model homes of all of the, the homes in the various states of Myanmar, Burma. And did you know that at least three of those eight states, their model home is a home for which under, uh, between the floorboards of the main floor, you are bringing the animals underneath and bringing them inside basically your house as the basement. And that was just for them, the rainy seasons, again, the birthing, the just, that's how you care for animals. In 2000 years, people may look back and say, wait, you had a dog in your house? <laughs> and cats and fish and what were they thinking? How, oh, what about the smell? What about, th this, was, this was just sort of a common thing. And so that's one of the reasons of the word use is there. But here's the other reason that I believe this is probably more the scenario of what's going on is because, uh, well, and here's, here's some of the more recent sort of digs and, and findings. And this is in Nazareth. Um, that, that fence structure has a word. And I, it's, it's kind of like what we have like at parks and stuff if you don't want cars to drive through, right? But you want pedestrians and bicycles to walk through. This is very common as far as what would have been the enclosed area for animals to come to, to be sort of in the house, but not in the house. And then that would have been a first floor. We're missing the front wall and the roof on this house. And then, of course, in the top floor. But this would have been more of a bottom floor, main floor, where animals would have been brought up to those posts and then stayed behind. Right. So that's that's sort of what they're finding in some of the, the homes there, some of the digs. Now. Here's the other reason that I would suggest this is probably more the scenario of what we see than our typical little barn, uh, you know, stable. The word, for, the word for travelers in that is used in scripture for the Good Samaritan is this word pandokion. And so that's the word when the Good Samaritan is placed along the road to a traveler's, hey, do you have room for my friend here, my my Samaritan, you know, this guy who's been beat up and uh, I will pay you. Then I'll come back and pay you again. Just give him a room. This is the word that's used, which means, again, hotel. <laughs> that's more the hotel. And the other is more of a guest room. End of the day. Don't worry. Keep keep your crush is and your nativities and all that. But um, I do believe that this is this is a likely scenario. And I think that's that's pretty interesting. Right. Um, so. The birth of Jesus, we're told that they get there, they have the birth of Jesus. Uh, the manger as well is, is a sort of a point of, well, what does that look like? What, what would that mean? Well, because of the, both the uh, animals kind of coming into the main floor, also the mangers were used for uh, newborn, uh, whether it was calves or sheep or whatever it might have been, goats, uh, as a way of inspection, but mainly for food. Uh, that the manger, these are some of the first century mangers uh, that they would have looked like. Right? Kind of this stone kind of trough looking thing. I can't say that one's from Nazareth, but it's from Palestine somewhere. And there's, there's many like that. That's pretty typical. Okay. Yes, Peggy. It wouldn't have been typical for them to put a, a, a human in No, no, would not have been. I always thought that was one of the reasons they uh, told the shepherds they're going to find this baby lying. In the yes. That, that would be unique. Absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. And, and really, it would have been more the situational. 
right? This is the place, the space we're in. This is what's available for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple other thoughts. I, this is the bonus I always like to throw in. Bethlehem, you know, the, the Hebrew for Bethlehem is Bet, house. Sometimes you see like uh, uh, Bet, uh, Bet El or Bet Emmanuel, the Jewish synagogues, house of God is usually what the Bet or Beth means here. But Bet and Lechem is bread. So Bethlehem was, was really known as the house of bread. Uh, it, grain fields, which worked great for shepherds because they would, again, the, the excess grain after harvest, all the sheep could come through and finish it off, be well fed. And then they would sort of fertilize all the grain fields for the next season. So there was this great relationship between the sheep farmers and the, the grain farmers there. Uh, but we also, it really does bring to mind John 6, 35, where Jesus says he is the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And just to sort of visualize this, you know, his, his coming into this world was uh, literally in the house of bread. So I think that's kind of a great connection, just an FYI. Then we get to the shepherds, right? So Jesus is born, and we're told that in the same region, shepherds are out, uh, and the, the angels come to, to him, and there'll be a sign, no star for the shepherds. Okay, so I think we, we might have mentioned that earlier. But what do we know about the shepherds? Well, for one, for as far as the eye could see around this part of Jerusalem toward Bethlehem, um, this it just made me think of, uh, oh, what's her face? Julia Andrews. Yeah, the hills were alive with the sound of sheep, for certainly. Um, Josephus, uh, the, 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 the really renowned uh, first, second century historian for the Roman Empire, though he was Jewish, he would say that uh, there were over 260,000 Passover lambs used annually at Passover. 260,000 lambs used as sacrifices for the annual Passover. The, the pilgrimage, right? Yeah, that's a lot of lambs. It takes a lot of, a lot of mamas, a lot of daddies, a lot of lambs that don't make the cut. One that's born in December, one that's born in February. So no certainty to that. But this was a year-round occupation for sure. To be a sacrificial lamb for Passover, you had to be, have a spotless lamb, one without clear blemish. Also had to be less than a year old. Also had to come from within five miles of the, ta of the temple. Those were the, the Jewish religious uh, restrictions for the Passover lamb. And so this is really sort of set, and they would literally become the lambs of God, right? So this is the setting of shepherds around Bethlehem, Jerusalem. Very important important job. In fact, it was almost like a, 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 a lamb factory of sorts. And much of it was overseen by the priest and the temple, right? And sort of generating all, all of these lambs. Um, and so that's, that's li a likely scenario. It wasn't just like, you know, a bunch of guys and their eight sheep just happened to be wandering around Bethlehem that night, right? It, it, this is a mega thing. And so important, remembering that, remember how important their job was, because we're going to see what they do here in a second. And so that reminds us, you know, John the baptizer, when he first sees Jesus, right? Behold the lamb of, of God. And now we have the sacrificial lambs and we're, we're the, sac the lamb of God. The shepherds, I think it's notable, are the first to receive the news of the, of, the, of the birth of Jesus, at least, if not the gospel. I think that's very notable. Wasn't the priest, wasn't the temple? The uh, but yeah, they would have been seen as outside and they would have been seen as um, loners, right? You're out in the field day and night, 24-7. Uh, and look at their response. Right. When the angels went away from them in heaven, they said, let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Well, what about all these sheep and these lambs? Let's go. We need to go. Right. And so they come, they, they visit Mary, the baby. They're also become the first to worship. We're wondered and the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as it had been told to them. The good news there. All right, and so finally we get to these sort of intriguing, mysterious, what do we do with them? Wise men, magi from the east, who were they? What do we know about them? Well, one, we know that the word used for um, Jesus, for child, okay, verse Nine until it came to rest over the place where the child was. This was a word, uh, uh, patio. Patio would have mean infant, toddler, so not newborn. So we know that uh, Mary stayed, 
for months, maybe a year and a half, two years, who knows? But it was a few years later. This is why we also know King Herod, when he put out the edict, he, he put it out for uh, baby boys how old? Two and under. Two and under. So it sort of gives an indication this is probably a time about a year, year and a half later that these wise men show up. Um, they reported to King Herod the Great. Uh, he'll be the first of three Herods we have in, in Scripture. He soon uh, would, would die off, and then we would see the um, and, and Antipas, um, who, would, uh, who would come and really be the one that Jesus stood before and was sent and killed John the Baptist. And then Agrippa would be the one that Paul stood before. But that was a family line there, um, the Her Herodian dynasty. So in that part, uh, these, these men from the east came. And a likely indication, uh, this was sort of astrology group. This was sort of uh, Zoroastrianism, I think. There's a pronunciation of that, but they were Zoroast, Zorist. Someone can correct me on that. Uh, they studied the stars. They were kind of into the cosmology aspect of things, also in times. Uh, but they were from Persia. Persia is Babylon. Babylon is obviously where the Jews had been for almost a hundred years, some remnant, some remnant stayed. So they were men who knew the scriptures as well, the Jewish scriptures. In fact, um, they, they quoted part of the scriptures when they talked about uh, the star itself. And they knew it was different, that it wasn't just a, an asteroid or it wasn't just a shooting star because it stood still. They knew there was something supernatural to it. And so they followed it. And then Micah 5, 2 um, they knew it was to be Bethlehem too, right? Micah 5, 2, but you, O Bethlehem, you are too little to be among the clans, for you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel. So this is how they show up at Herod's door. Herod, we, we know from our scriptures, we know from reading the stars, we believe the one who's going to be ruler over all Israel has been born. Well, how did Herod take that? Yeah. What do you mean the one over? I'm the one over. <laughs> what, what are you guys talking? Oh, no, no. It's in the scriptures and this star. It's been sitting out and we've read this. We know. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I want to worship this new king of Israel. You go find him. Tell me everything you can about him. And so they're off. So when they get there, Isaiah 60 verse 6 might come to mind for them because they arrive and it says they, they know, right? They, they arrived when they saw the star, they rejoiced and, and going into the house. Hmm. Maybe the same house, maybe a different house. They saw the child with Mary, the child there again, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. In the presence of Jesus, you can't help but worship. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And you say, well, man, how did they know that's what Jesus would want? How did they, was there, you know, did Mar Miriam have a, what do they call it, a registry? <laughs> I was wondering what he did with you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Isaiah 60, verse 6, they shall, a multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels that are all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and they shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Uh, this is talking about the future glory of Israel. That when he, was, when he would come forward, that this is what people would just come to him and some of them would bring gold and frankincense and that that would be what would be brought before the new king. And so they know their Hebrew scriptures as well. And this is what they brought when they arrived. They said, well, we just know. We know this, this all has to be divinely orchestrated. And because we know, we are not going to go tell Herod anything. <laughs> In fact, we're going to go back to our home. We're going to go on around him and go back to Persia. And so they departed to their country by another way, <laughs> which I always thought was great. So um, the first Christmas, the prophecies fulfilled, and we'll wrap it up here in a second. The prophecies fulfilled. We know the Lion of David from Isaiah 11, 1, the born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, the town of Bethlehem in Micah 5, 2, the star from Numbers 24. We know the humble and low esteem that is demonstrated throughout all of these individuals, Isaiah 53, 3. And that's just a handful of the many others that we see in Scripture pointing us to uh, this night in Bethlehem. And out of all of this this morning, what I was hopeful, again, we would gain is just a, a, a wonder, an awe uh, in preparation for our upcoming celebration of, of Christmas and the, and the narrative of Jesus, some insight 
And yet at the end of the day, whether it was a barn or a cave or there were three men or 300 wise men, which we don't know, the important part of our celebration of Christmas and the narrative of Christmas is that a promise was fulfilled, a presence was revealed, Emmanuel, God with us, and the purpose was unsealed. Uh, that he had come to a point now that the, his plan of redemption was being la uh, laid out and opened up through his coming to uh, be incarnate with us, fully man, fully God. And that's the Christmas narrative. Any thoughts or questions? or? But to me, the language of Scripture speaks to, uh, and, the, and the cultural context of the day, speaks to it being a family member house, distant family member. Um, and that it, our idea, again, I think this is the danger is where we say, oh, you know, and we act it out, right? And we say, okay, you play the innkeeper, right? You, no, 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 no room in the inn. And you say, wait, 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 that's a, <laughs> so, yeah, again, don't, don't stand up at a children's play and say, yeah, that's not right. But um, <laughs> scripturally, that's not even the word that's used. So it's more, it would have, and, and to think that a family would have said, oh, I know you're pregnant, whether it's four months or nine months. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go out back down the field and in the holler with, you know, we got cows underneath the stable and that's where you can have your baby. I, I don't think anybody would have done that. I think they would have said, hey, we're, we're, it's slammed in here. This is like a good old spin the night. And what we got is first floor will make you comfortable. Again, we're all used to the smells. It's no big deal. And they would have said, thank you. Thank you very much. But I, do, I think it's really neat, whether intentionally divine, divinely inspired or not. I think it's, in, it's great to think that the, it was the lower room, the lower room that Jesus entered into this world. And then we get that vision of the upper room for which he's saying goodbye. And so like there wasn't any room up there, right? And so he's humbled. He's brought in at what would have been the lowest place in the house as far as respect towards someone. And yet when he, ha when he finally has room in the uh, Cataluma, you know, it's, it's his sort of uh, his final mission fulfilled moment. And, uh, and we really see who he is come through there. Um, let me just say a prayer, Lord, we thank you that you came into this world. We thank you that what you gave us in Scripture is sufficient to our knowledge uh, to know that you came and dwelt with us and that you took on our flesh and that you uh, lived and died. And uh, so we celebrate uh, that you would humble yourself, that it humbles us just to, just to consider it. And may our heart, Lord, be that of Mary's. May we celebrate you with praise and song. And when you're in your presence, Lord... May we always be in your presence, but may we just not help but worship you. And uh, we just ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah.